Hello and welcome, dear listeners, episode 228 of the Reform Gamers, a show all about theology, video games, and 24 karat magic. I'm your host, Logan. And I am his co-host, Micah. <laughs> <laughs> and joining us, this man really needs no introduction at this point, Jonathan Sound of the Rain, the man, the myth, the legend himself, is joining the Reform Gamers yet again to talk about Metal Gear Solid. Man, say hello to the dear listeners. What's going on, everybody? How's everybody doing? Tune in. Man, I'm doing it. We're doing great, man. In case people don't know, because when I mentioned 24 Karat Magic, both these guys just about <laughs> lost it. Uh, if you aren't following me on Twitter, you need to go to twitter.com slash the Theologian and look up the, the post I made about how I warm up for doing YouTube videos. It's uh, entertaining. I put it out there for your enjoyment. Go, uh, go, and, <laughs> go and enjoy. Uh, but yeah, no. If I if I put on Bruno Mars, man, I just I get to singing, man. Yeah. I can't I can't help it. I can't help you it. You was feeling just, it. You was hitting them high notes and everything, man. <laughs> I was trying, man. I was trying. <laughs> you know, the Lord blessed me with an amazing voice. Unfortunately, you can't really use it for singing, um, but you can use it for, <laughs> for at least a podcast. Noise. <laughs> Make that joyful noise, man. <laughs> Y'all may be cringing and your ears may be bleeding, but the Lord is glorified through it. So <laughs> that's, how, that's how we do. Anyway, dear listeners, we are super excited. I can't, I don't, literally in the pre-show, in the pre-pre-show, we almost talked ourselves out of everything that we were feeling about Metal Gear Solid 3 to the point where we didn't, we, we were like, no, we don't need to do an episode at this point. We're just that excited. But we are very excited to talk about Metal Gear Solid 3. And dare I say, it's one of the greatest games of all time. And we'll get into that a little bit later as to why that is. But yeah, it, we finally reached it. This has been the, the episode that I have been waiting for because this is this game. Hot diggity dog. If you have not played the game, you, look, I don't tell people to play very many games outside of Titanfall 2 and um, Live Alive. But, uh, oh, and Persona 4 Golden. But trust me, this, oh, if you haven't played it, you're missing out. You are missing out. But speaking of missing out and things of that nature, I don't have a good segue for this. <laughs> but hello and welcome to the show. As always, you know, we like to like to do some things here, right? We like to get a little in, into a little housekeeping before we get into the show. Let you know some of the things we've got going on here at TRG. As always, if you're not subscribed to us over on YouTube, you're missing out on a bevy I think that's the right word, a bevy of content over there uh, with reviews, retrospectives, YouTube shorts of Solid Snake. Well, no, not Solid Snake, but Snake climbing up the incredibly long ladder in Metal Gear Solid. And then once he gets to the top, he throws up because it makes him sick. You're missing out on a ton of things. You need to go check it out. Uh, there's so many things out there. I forget everything I've put up there uh, in the last couple of weeks. So just go over there, check out the videos, binge watch them, share them, like them, subscribe, enjoy and do all that other stuff. It's always a good time over there. Now, before we get into the show, guys, our patrons, they, as always, if you support TRG over on Patreon, you can write in to the show, to each episode, and the write-ins don't even have to be on topic, right? You can be like Jeff Jackson Jr. here, dancing to the beat of his own drum, which we always enjoy, and he just says, uh, I would like for you to, to discuss this, which is a Persona 5 card game. Persona 5 as a card. Now, here's my deal. Y'all know I love Persona 5. Well, not as much as Persona 4, but I do love Persona. The fact, that, though, that we're getting... What was it, what was that last thing we talked about last week in the last episode, Micah? It was some other game getting a, a tabletop edition. What was that? Do you remember? It was the... Um, <clears throat> oh, crud. Uh, I'm, I'm drawing a, a straight blank right now. It was, it was uh, we talked about Resident Evil and Elden Ring, Ring or something like that, but what was That's it? what it was, Elden Ring. Yeah, Elden Ring? That's what it was. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, man, all these games. Let me just read the thing that uh, that Jeff sent in here. It's published by Pandasaurus Games, which, if you guys don't know, Pandasaurus did the Godspeed tabletop game, which we did a couple episodes on. You can go check those out in the back catalog. Uh, in partnership with Atlas, the game is designed by Emerson Matsuchi, whose prior credits include Century, Eastern Wonders, and Foundations of Rome. Do I know what those are? No, but some of you have probably heard of them, and you're probably a little interested at this point here. But it says here about the game itself, players will take on the roles of their favorite phantom thieves and fight to change the world in this cooperative, card-based strategy game. And so, I'm going to be honest with you, Jeff, and I'll turn it over to these guys here in a second. I'm I'm hooked. One of my favorite tabletop games that, that me and my wife own is called Clank. It's like a dungeon-crawling, uh, card-building kind of game. 
easily one of my favorite tabletop games we own. So anything like that's deck building or card building, I'm told I'm going to check it out. But what do you guys think? Are you guys interested in tabletop games? Interested in this at all? Sound of the Rain. Let's kick it off to you first, man. I've never played one, but I found in the the most recent season of uh, Stranger Things, they were going into like the D and D thing, kind of heavy. And then I yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of saw like the intrigue behind it. I was like. You make up these scenarios and you're actually like talking them out and like, I mean, it looked really cool. So I don't know if the persona thing would be similar to that, but um, mm-hmm. I'm definitely open to uh, to try new, you know, fun experiences, especially when they're nerd related. So, you know, yeah. I'm down. Yeah, it doesn't have a lot of details here in the article link. You know, of course, yep. it says here, you know, fight to change the world in this cooperative card based strategy game. Other than that. The details are kind of scant and um, they say it's going to release in q4 of 2023 so i'm just kind of a wait and see kind of guy like i'm always down for a good tabletop game but um you know i'm not a persona fan um that doesn't get me one way or the other um i've never played mm-hmm. a persona game um so yeah it's i'm sort of meh on this like if it's a good game great but like just just the fact that it has persona on it doesn't necessarily make me go jumping at it that's you know so true, true that's kind of where i'm at i, I guess the true question is and but those of you that hang out in the Discord will get this joke, and those of you that are that have followed TRG for a while now, at least in terms of YouTube, the real question is: Is the Persona Five card game better than Persona Five? Exactly. We'll find out. We'll find out. But something else that uh, we can at least definitely talk about now, because we do have details on, is uh, what we've been playing. We've been playing a couple of games here over the last couple of weeks, and let's kind of switch gears here and talk about that. Jonathan, as always, man, you are the guest, so you get to go first, man. What have you been playing? I've been playing um, Hot Wheels Unleashed. Um, and it yes. recently came on uh, PlayStation Plus. So um, I, I actually wanted to buy it when I saw like, the trailers and stuff for it. I was like, oh, yeah, this mm-hmm. is it. Um, but when I played it, I have to get used to the controls because I'm like used to yeah. like Mario Kart. Like I, I jump in the air right. and I can hold it and I'm drifting like almost the whole yeah. race. This is kind of yeah, different, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, and then there were a lot of like, I'm assuming they're loot boxes uh, or it's like kind of that kind of vibe because every time like I would play like a match, like some box will pop up and a new car would come out. But I didn't pay for anything. OK, but um, OK. Yeah. So I got to get my hands a little more dirty with it. But uh, so far, so good. That's all I've been know, playing. Man. Yeah. That's it's funny that you bring that one up because I remember seeing it that it was going to be one of the PS plus games for October. And I was like, that's awesome. I was like, Oh yeah, I bought that around Christmas and I haven't played it yet. What is wrong with me? But no, that's cool. So did you say, so it's got like loot boxes in it. Or do you just unlock those through gameplay itself or. Okay. Just gameplay. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I was, I was nodding to, to, to Logan, uh, but yeah, no, I, I played this game as well and it's, it, it is not, Okay. intrusive loot boxes like you're thinking it has okay. they literally are like you know loot boxes as far as like it's a box that opens a thing but it's just getting new hot wheels cars at okay. all it's, it's just the game's way okay. of unlocking new cars there okay i think there is a currency i'm kind of like maybe crash team racing if you've played that there is a currency you can use that okay. costs real money that you can use to get more of these things but just play the game like usual and you will be unlocking cars mm-hmm. just fine no problem yeah. Okay, so it's really not that big of an issue. No, then. I didn't think so. I, I played the game okay. a good bit, and I never had to spend real money or never felt tempted to or anything okay. like that. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Cool, cool, cool. That's good to know. I forgot to mention, I meant to add this note in there into the docs, but I think I accidentally hit reject or something like that. But our editor is actually playing the game too, but he didn't add anything beyond that. He just wanted us to know. That, uh, that he's playing it as well. So if you want to know what his thoughts are, hit him up in the Discord and be like, hey, what do you think of this game, dude? It's an awesome game. Um, yeah. but no, I need to play. I remember, like, I picked that up because I, like, I used to play with Hot Wheels all the time as a kid. Like, my grandparents would always get me, like, new ones around Christmas or something. And, man, like, just, I was like, well, I want that well, nostalgia. Didn't you, so. Logan, didn't you play the Forza Hot Wheels expansion? I did. I did. <laughs> Maybe that yeah. burned you out. I'm just guessing. I don't know. Like, that was your Hot Wheels no, fix? No, it's just kind of, I mean, I guess it did. I, I, it's probably going to be hard to go play this game now after I played Forza because it's just it's just a finely tuned racing game. But I don't really have a have anything to speak on because I haven't played this one. But but yeah, I think I think it probably did. I'm also distracted by a lot of different games right now, so it's yeah, it's hard for me to go back to just to just play Hot Wheels. But maybe I'll maybe I'll do that after this episode. No, but I, I can I can just back up that that recommendation from Jonathan. Hot Wheels Unleashed is is a great game. So yeah, maybe we can get a, a match or two in, guys. Yeah, there, there we go. I'll be down. 
I that would be awesome. Yeah. We did do that with Ninja Turtles. Might as well do oh, it with Hot Wheels. That was amazing. Yeah. That's My question stuff. is, and maybe you're not far enough in, and you guys will have to let me know and people can write in on this. In, in this Hot Wheels game, can you get like a silver dragon car that has like the dragon head looping over the driver's seat? Maybe I, I hadn't remember. seen anything like that, but I mean, okay. they've, they've got okay. hundreds. Of, I mean, like I'd assume almost every hot any Hot Wheel that's ever been made in real life. Okay, they probably put it in the game because it's I've a lot of cool okay. cars. A lot yeah. of them are like, oh, I had this one growing up. That kind of mm-hmm. thing. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. I only asked just because, like, that was one I I like very distinctly remember from growing up and it was my favorite Hot Wheels I had. So I, I just need to play the they game. They very well might have it. it. I just I may not be remembering it right now. So yeah. Fair enough. I will say if they have it in there, I will definitely cry. I will definitely <laughs> <laughs> But before we get awkward over here, Micah, man, what have you been playing? Well, speaking of crying and pain <laughs> and dying a lot. I just now saw what you're playing. <laughs> I've been, uh, I, I rebooted back up my uh, my game of that year when it came out. Was it 2020? Uh, uh, the game of the year that year for me, Returnal. Um, this game has some new uh, DLC added to it since I first started playing, since, since, since its release. It has the, um, I guess, the endless mode the tower of sisyphus where you sort of just go and keep going on these waves and waves of harder and harder uh enemy difficulty waves and then it also has some co-op that it's added so i actually um i booted up with uh nate mckeever a patron in front of the show over at the backlog breakdown podcast and we played a little bit of co-op on his game um we thought we were going to be able to play some tower of sisyphus but it turns out you can't do that in co-op um that was kind of a bummer oh, okay. we realized uh, that's only a solo thing but um played hmm. some co-op there that's just that's a lot of fun we were trying to figure out kind of what resources you share and what you don't share and, and getting that all figured out but it's returnal and co-op pretty much like you'd expect it, it is not easier because you're in co-op it's still really hard they ramp up that yeah. difficulty because you got the extra player and then, uh, but I want to talk about the Tower of Sisyphus mainly. That is legit fun. That I have, I am rehooked by Returnal now. Um, this awesome. mode is it's just a score chasing mode, very much like what Housemark is is known for with games like oh, okay. like um, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, the PS4 launch game, Resogun. Um, Resogun. Thank you. Uh, like Resogun and, uh, and and games of their their kind of arcade past. Okay. So really cool mode. Um, and it's, what's funny, I got this little note in here to remind me. What got me back into the game is that stupid PlayStation Stars Rewards Initiative that you can get these like digital collectibles and stuff. And one of the goals for October was to boot up a handful of games and just play them. And one of them was Returnal. So I'm like, yeah, I'll re-download that. And I started playing. I was like, oh, well, this is pretty good. I'm going to play this Tower of Sisyphus. And oh, I'm, I've, <laughs> I've been playing for four hours now. And I'm, yeah, so <laughs> I'm totally back into Returnal now. Thank you, PS Stars, for getting me back into that game. So yeah, that's what I've been playing. Man, I got to ask, what's your impression of PS Stars? It is perfectly inoffensive. It, it, it's just... <laughs> uh, it, it's... It, it, if you're upset about it, like you need to check yourself. I think like it's like, well, this is lame. It's like, dude, it's it's free first and foremost, and it's just like yeah. it's these silly little collectibles. And if you if you buy some games, you get some coins that you can redeem towards more PSN money or whatever. There's like it's just a typical yeah. kind of you know like Nintendo has their you know gold and platinum coin system yeah. where you can you know shave off a few bucks off of a purchase of a digital game there's yeah. really nothing wrong with it it's it's not like crazy awesome but it's just kind of it's so funny andre rook who we had on the show recently for the um trophy and achievement episode he was joking around with me in the in the thread because he was posting another uh, platinum he had gotten and i was like bro you're about to you're about to surpass me in platinum counts. He's like, oh, don't forget it, man. Or like, don't don't sweat it. The real measure of a man now is his PlayStation Stars level. <laughs> I about died. <laughs> so so I think me and him are both actually chasing the PS Stars digital collectibles right now. <laughs> Trying That's to get awesome. all those. <laughs> it's so <That's> dumb. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I had I had opened it up and was like, all right, this is fine. Like, yeah, it is what it is. Oh, I yeah. unlocked the T Rex thing from the original PlayStation demo. And that's that's pretty cool. But my thing is like, because you can unlock the digital collectibles, which for those curious, no, they're not NFTs. Um, like, I'm trying to find a way to like show them off, and I'm like, man, I wish we had like PlayStation Home, so you could have like your own little room and put those trophies up mm-hmm. somewhere. Because like, I would I would be all about Let's that. Do it. <laughs> but 
you know, that's a that's a throwback to the let's bring it back PlayStation Three. Let's bring back the PlayStation Home. Come on, come on, Jim Ryan. Let's do it. You know you want to. <laughs> You can show off your. I'm, I'm not going to make fun of him. I'm going to continue on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so as far as what I've been playing, um, I've got two spooky games I'm going to talk about. Um, and I, I'm going to start off with this uh, Man of Medan and Little Hope got PS5 updates uh, within the last couple of weeks or so with like better frame rates, some extra choices, different things like that. And I was like, you know. I never did finish Man of Medan, so let's go ahead and, and play that and play it with the updates. So, you know, because I love 60 frames per second, fresh coat of paint, let's play it. Let me just say this to y'all. I played this game so you don't have to. Oh, my. Okay? Playing this game was a chore for me and my wife. You know, me and my wife, we, we like these kind of games. We loved Until Dawn. We love The Quarry. We, we love all those games. We played Little Hope. We have played House of Ash. We never finished Man of Medan. And so we booted it up, did the movie night one where you pass the controller, like you decide who controls what character you pass the controller back and forth. It's a good time. But there's a point where the curator asks, hey, do you want a hint? I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll take a hint. You know, if it's going to help me out, why not? If you do that, if you answer anything but stay silent, it glitches the game and it just keeps you at a loading screen that just never changes if you do that. So I was like great this is a game that came out when and this is a ps5 update and this is still a problem hmm. that's a bummer but then we we just went ahead and played just a single player we got all the way back up to where we were then we just passed the controllers anyway and man i don't know what they did or didn't do or what kind of code they used for this ps5 update but man was it buggy there was some of the stuff is minor, like texture pop-ins, but there was literal stuff where the characters would get stuck on the ground and wouldn't move. <laughs> mm. And I'm like, this is where I'm supposed to go. Like, What's happening here? And there'd be times where like the frame rate would kind of chug a little bit. And I'm just like, man, it, it, it oh, oh, dang, man. I, they, they clearly, uh, I'm being a little harsh here, but I mean... Supermassive, you brought this on yourselves. <laughs> they didn't do enough quality assurance with their testing it or anything like that, polishing like they should have. Like, this would have been the prime opportunity to give this game a breath of fresh air. And and I looked on the subreddit, too. There's a lot of people having issues with not even Man of Medan, not even just Man of Medan, but lot, Little Hope as well. And, like, man, this is disappointing, to yeah. say the least. It's super massive. You, you I don't think anyone... Man of, of Madang, more like it. Man of Madang, yeah. Man of Madon't, no. Uh, <laughs> man of Madoogie. Man of no, like, move on from this joke now. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But no, like, it's just... It, it's, it was really disappointing, man. And I'm like... It, and I'm not going to spoil the story, but I will say that, like, the twist just kind of makes you go, none of this really matters then. Why am I playing this? Yeah. So oh, that's the worst. I hate to hear that, man. Oh boy, was that rough? It's rough. That, I, Sorry, I mean, what? you know, I, I said I hate to hear that. Just you know, super massive. You know, I, I never did play those. Um, you know, uh, the the whole kind of anthology that they're putting on here with Man of Medan and Little Hope mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But um, yeah, looks like I'll just be staying away um, and just yeah. uh, enjoy the quarry and until dawn. Yep. Yep. That's that's peak super massive right there is those two there. But yeah, man, it's it was rough. And so, you know, with it being October, though, I was like, man, I'm feeling a spooky mood. I put out a YouTube short calling the Dead Space remakes box art boring and people got <clears> mad at me. And I'm like, you know what? I think I'm going to play Dead Space to kind of punish myself a little bit. And I started playing that again. And y'all, this game. Uh, first of all, I'm glad it's getting a remake because it, it definitely looks kind of dated a little bit. But holy cow, this game still holds up in a lot of areas. Like it, it still is scaring me, even though I played it multiple times. I, I, I booted this up on my Xbox and was looking at the achievements and I only was missing like six of them. And I'm like, why didn't I just go get the rest of them? So that's what I'm trying to do uh, awesome. during this playthrough is getting the other uh, trophy or the other achievements. Sorry, Xbox fans, not trophies. Um yeah, this game still holds up. And I'm playing this with headphones because when I record, I have to like have my computer on and then I run the audio through my computer. And so I'm playing it with headphones and it is like a whole new experience. Like I'm hearing things I didn't hear before when I played in the games. Like 
as you progress through the game, you hear Isaac's wife like whispering in the background, kind of like Hellblade sending you a sacrifice okay. with the voices whispering. You hear other people like whispering and stuff. It is really unsettling and creepy. But man, it oh, just the sound design alone. I hope they yeah. capture they recapture that in the remake because that's that's the bulk of it. Like the sound design is just really good. When the necromorphs zoom in, it's loud, it's chaotic, it's scary, it's so good. You're right, man. It's just I, man. I, I forgot how good Dead Space is. Yeah, I was just about to say I forgot how good the sound design is. But you kind of mentioning it, and I'm, I'm thinking back, like, yeah, it did have excellent sound design. I remember yeah. that. I am so, so ready for this remake, Logan. You have no oh, idea. I am too. I think I'm more I on board too. for this remake than I am for Resident Evil Four. Actually, believe it or not. Um, yeah. I am. Yeah. I love Dead Space. It's, it's one of I my very, very favorite before. games ever made. Yeah. Oh, dude! Man, <laughs> so you feel like scary with. games? I, I, uh, if it's, it sounds like it has like you OG like Resident games? Evil vibes. So I mean, it. You know, I'm down for mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, oh, it's so good. It's so good. It's There's, one of the best. It, if I can interject real quick, Logan, it's one of the best yeah. set pieces in games, in my opinion. Uh, absolutely, at the, uh, at the um, Ishimura, the ship where it takes place. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. absolutely. And, and plus, what I like about this game too, like one of my favorite sci-fi horror movies of all time, is Alien. Right, like right. I, I love that the whole setting, Ripley, the Xenomorphs, the little face hugger things. Heck, in Fall Guys, their new season pass thing, you can unlock a Xenomorph costume and they have the face hugger in the store at one point. <laughs> oh, wow. like, Give me all of them. <laughs> and, uh, man, it just, it really kind of plays on that a little bit, but ramps the scare up even even more. And I'm like, man, this, ooh, I need to do a video on it. I need to do a video on it and just gush about it. It's, it's so good. I found a clip, actually, um, when I was playing it, because that's just what I do now. I just record any game I play now just because I'm like, in case I want to do a YouTube video or do something, I might as well just have keep it, it rolling. There. There's this, there's this scene I get off where you get off the elevator and there's this guy standing like in this doorway and it's kind of dark. It's creepy. And he says something like, uh, what was it like unify us again or something? And he's just standing there staring. And then he walks off and I'm like, why am I thinking of Weird Al Yankovic right now? Where he's like, and he looks at me and I look at him. <laughs> like, that's all I could think of. And then I was like, you know what? I know just enough Premiere Pro to make this happen. So I made it happen. It's over on YouTube right now. You can go look at it and enjoy that. Because I just, I hadn't it seen was that so yet. funny, man. I hadn't seen that yet. It's so yeah. funny. It's so funny. Patrons, you can go check this out. Um, it should post. October 13th by 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. So you should be able to see it by the time this goes live. <laughs> it's, or if you're in the Discord, it's actually over there too. But man, Dead Space is, oh, it's a good time. I'm, it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. So, so good. You know what? You know what else is so, so good? Rating and reviewing the podcast over on iTunes. By the way, Super Llama, thank you so much for your review. I actually don't have it pulled up, so I'll have to read it for the next episode. But I appreciate the review. Y'all, if you are on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, wherever, make sure you leave a rating and review. If you're on YouTube, hit the like button. Leave a little comment down below uh, about, I don't know, if you have a hot take on anything could be you know you think raising canes is overrated or something just leave it in the comments and let's see what kind of brawls we can start but speaking of things that are also good we've come to the time where we talk about metal gear solid 3 this is the time i have been waiting for because metal gear solid 3 i'm not gonna lie there was a time in the show when uh me and adam both we just got our playstation 3s after you know not having one, and we and we played through the Metal Gear Solid games, and I think you can go back and listen to it. Metal Gear Solid as a whole blew my mind. Metal Gear Solid One still holds up pretty well. It's the graphics are you know old, but it still holds up pretty well. Metal Gear Solid Two is creepy because it basically you know predicted the future. Metal Gear Solid Three is literally one of the most perfect games I've ever played, and we're gonna get into that um, a little bit here. As we get into it now, in case you're new to the show and maybe, you know, this is your first time tuning in, what we typically do during these sections, we'll go over some development highlights, some fun facts. I'll try to avoid the spoilers as best as I possibly can. 
and then we'll do a plot synopsis. And after that, we'll give you spoiler warnings. So you can listen into that point. If you're watching on YouTube, you have timestamps for literally every little topic that we switch into. So you can jump around to the sections you want to listen to uh, and things of that nature too, which is a, a fun thing I like to do on YouTube. So let's get into some of the development highlights, some fun facts about the game real quick, and then we'll uh, get into the game, the meat of the game proper. Now, y'all remember... We were talking about, I think it was Metal Gear Solid 1, how Solid Snake was modeled after Christopher Walken, right? Y'all remember that? Yeah. I put that on Twitter. Some people were like, wait a minute, what the heck? Oh, yeah. So here's the thing about Metal Gear Solid 3. Okay, you know Kojima. You know he loves his movies. This game, obviously, if you couldn't tell, was heavily influenced by Predator. It takes place in a forest. You got the camouflage that you're mixing and matching with. You got the, the traps that you're doing. But here's another fun fact about the game. Snake was meant to be built kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger and be over six foot tall and voiced by Kurt Russell, who declined to do so, which is kind of a bummer, but I get it. So that didn't happen. Clearly, what wound up happening is obviously Snake wound up looking like Solid Snake, who, uh, you know what, just for the sake of spoilers, I'm not going to say this other part until we get into the spoiler section. But, yeah, that was the thing that I, I honestly laughed at. I was like, can you imagine playing Metal Gear Solid and it's Arnold Schwarzenegger? And he's just like – Kojima. I, I don't even know. Kojima had some sort of weird obsession with Kurt Russell because he's got the you know the whole you – know, obviously Snake, you know, Escape from New York, you know, Iroquois Pliskin yep. from Metal Gear yep. Solid 2, all that stuff. So he, he definitely had an affinity for, for Kurt Russell. I'm glad that didn't happen obviously because I love um, David Hayter as the voice of Snake. Yep. You know, a Same. big reason why I didn't like Metal Gear Solid Five, but anyway, different story. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm right there with you. David Hayter is like the uh, Kurt, you know, the Kevin Conroy to Batman uh, for me, and I think it's the same. I think Sound of the Rain mentioned that too, either on this episode or in a pre-show at one point. I don't remember us talking about Kevin Conroy, um, but yeah. So, continuing on, uh, Kojima included a write-in look-alike so players could take out their frustrations on him to appease burn players from Metal Gear Solid 2. Um, if you start the game up, there's actually, if you start the game up, it'll ask you, um, like, it gives you a couple options. Like, I like Metal Gear Solid 1, I like Metal Gear Solid 2, I like Metal Gear Solid 3. And uh, this might just be in a subsistence version, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I picked, I like Metal Gear Solid 2 because I'm like, yeah, I love Metal Gear Solid 2. I might be one of the few people who say that uh, and admit that in public. But when you start the game up, you you get this uh, camouflage that's a, a lab suit and a mask for oh, – I can't remember the character's name. But it's like this uh, military general who is kind of in cahoots with Volgan, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, and you can use that to sneak around the labs. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is really cool. But they included that and constantly would take pot shots at Raiden and uh, included the character who looked like Raiden so you can take out your frustrations on him because he was just – Kojima, you could tell in some interviews and stuff, he really just felt burned by Raiden, even though he was trying to build him up so he could hand the series off to uh, a younger team, but that just didn't happen. So if you really hate Raiden, play Metal Gear Solid 3. Mm -hmm. Although I will say it's hard to really hate Raiden after playing Metal Gear Rising Revengeance because Raiden's <laughs> such a dope character, but... yeah. Um, he gets his due in, what in MGS4 and in Rhino. Yeah. Redemption yeah, he does, for real. Yeah, he, does. <laughs> he redeems himself. Um, so a few uh, fun facts about the game. There's a, a, This game has some weird like time paradoxes where like it takes place in 1964, which is a year after Kojima's birth. Um, he wanted to take place, I think it was in 1963, but he wanted the Kennedy assassination to be included as well, so that it had to take place in 1964. Um, so there's a lot of historical stuff in there that where like it tries to maintain that, but there's these weird time paradoxes that happen in the game, like weird things that happen. Like for example, Calorie Mate is a is an item that you get in the game that restores your stamina, but it's a real product sold in Japan. But the game takes place 20 years before this product was actually made, so there's that. There's other things like when you're in the labs, you'll see magazines for uh, I think it's like Game Pro, Game Informer. Uh, I think like Xbox Magazine was in mine because I was playing it on Xbox. Maybe PSM so, as well. I'm not sure. Yeah, PSM might be in the PlayStation version. Those of you that played it on PlayStation, you have to let me know. Um, so it's got weird things like that. Um, what's really cool is the actor for Major Zero actually did the voice of Doc Brown in the Japanese dub of Back to the Future. So there's even that adding in there. Um, it's 
it's got a, this game. It has a lot of weird things with time that it plays with. And we'll get into that a little bit because one of the bosses, you can really manipulate time to take him out. And that was the other thing, too, is that Kojima wanted the boss fights in this game to be completely different from those of the last couple of games going so far as that. In the original idea for the fight with the end, who's the really old guy uh, that's the sniper, Kojima wanted that fight to take place over the course of a few weeks. I don't know if that means a few weeks in real time or a few weeks in like in the game, but I, I don't know if I could handle <laughs> that. Would have been uh, a few week that that would be really long. <laughs> that would be really long. Um, as far as the music, you really can't. You can't talk about this game without talking about the music. And Josh Broccolo writes in and says, Snake Eater. That's a really poor rendition. Josh is a better <laughs> singer than I am. But he he puts in parentheses, I've never played the game, so I don't have anything to contribute. But, man, you contributed a great segue into the music itself. <laughs> Harry Gregson Williams told Kojima that he wouldn't work on the game unless it took place in the rainforest. And Kojima was like, I've already got this planned out. So, yeah, I'm just going to lead Williams on to kind of think that this was his idea. And then when he signed on, he told him, I actually had this planned out, you, you know, but it was already going to be a rainforest, take place in the rainforest. And he's like, oh, all right, fine. <laughs> and so the music, because it took place in the 60s, it really pulled from music of that time that was – uh, related to like spy espionage stuff bond especially had a heavy role to play in not only the music but how a uh, snake acts in the game and how kind of the women act towards him uh, but a, w with a little twist to it too like they're still they saw that feminine wiles and mystique and stuff but it's a little different than how you see it in a bond movie around that time where um, we'll get into it a little bit later. Now, this game originally launched, and I didn't even include the release date for it, but I'll go ahead and look that up real quick while we're looking that up at the game. 2004, I think. 2004, there we go. Um, but this game originally launched uh, on the PS2 with an overhead camera similar to the one featured in the previous games. And... I never played this version, so I don't know how this camera is, but from – okay, Sound of the Rain's putting his thumb down. It's it's not good. There's a reason they released the subsistence version and gave you a free-moving camera, not – I didn't <laughs> realize how yeah. bad the camera was until I played subsistence, though, because, like, I'm, you, yeah. you're just kind of like, this is all you have, so you kind of make it work. But then when yeah. you play subsistence, it's like, oh, man, like, this is world's Night and day difference. Yeah, yeah man. It's – it's pretty wild. I, I never knew that because, again, like my first experience with Metal Gear Solid was with my friend who had Metal Gear Solid 2, but he also got Metal Gear Solid 3, and I, but I never went over to his house to play it, so I never got to see the game. I saw the ads and stuff like in the rainforest, but like I never got to see the game itself, so I never knew about this camera until I was doing this research, so mm. – that's wild. I understood what he's going for, but I guess it was pretty annoying because, like, guards would constantly spot you off screen and you couldn't see him. And so, I mean, it was hard enough having the free moving camera. I can only imagine how rough it would be with the fixed camera. But Subsistence also came with a lot of other features like Metal Gear, not Metal Gear Solid, Metal Gear 1 and 2 on the disc, which is from, like, the NES, which is really cool. It came with a uh, an online mode, so like multiplayer for like deathmatch and things like that. Um, a game I have the um, back of the box for uh, subsistence pulled up here. That on the back. Okay, so here's the extra things that it comes with: all new online gameplay, including deathmatch, team deathmatch, sneaking mission, capture mission, and rescue mission. Uh, complete Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater game with a new user-controlled 3D camera. That's the one we just mentioned. Um, never before released games, Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2. Secret Theater Mode, which is always a fun one to play around with. I'm sure we'll talk about that. Dual Mode and new stages for Snake vs. Monkey minigame. I didn't even know that was on there. I went to look that up. And then uh, game connectivity with Metal Gear Acid 2 on the PSP. And that was kind of the other cool thing um, about Subsistence is that it included an online mode that allowed you to play these online multiplayer games that would be more refined, and we'd later see that in Portable Ops and Metal Gear Solid 4. So in a way, you know, Kojima re-releasing the game in the subsistence version was kind of a blessing in disguise because it allowed them to add in those other things uh, in those later games. But 
yeah, guys, do you have anything to add, some interesting tidbits or anything that you probably came across while you were uh, researching or checking things out for this game or some things you I may have glossed over? When I got it, it, um, it was no, a I was special. Just gonna, it, oh, my, no, go ahead. You're good, man. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, you, um, go ahead. It's you. I got the uh, special edition of uh, Subsistence, and it came with a third disc called Existence. I had to, like, Google it to remember what it was called, but it was like the game on a movie. And it was uh, three and a half oh. hours long. And I used to play it every night and fall asleep to it. Like, I wouldn't necessarily watch it, but I would just, like, listen to it and fall asleep and wake up. And the yeah. title screen would be on there. But uh, And I think the Ape game you were talking about, it had the monkeys from Ape Escape in it. And the very easy yeah. mode had, like, okay. a, a bubble gun or something. I, I had to Google it, but I couldn't remember what it was. And a chicken hat. Was that what it was? A chicken hat? Or was that another Metal Gear game? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't remember. I, I do remember getting the subsistence version. I, I talked about that maybe in a, a previous episode, but um, the big deal was that camera angle for sure. That was like what everyone yeah. was talking about. And I remember at first I didn't like it because I was used to – it was the same exact camera angle that was used in the original Metal Gear Solid 2 was used in the original mm-hmm. Metal Gear Solid 3. It just didn't translate as well to that game being outdoors right. and everything else. Uh, not that there, you weren't outdoors in the other one, but anyway, it just didn't translate as well. So when they came yeah. out with the new camera system, I remember it took me a while to kind of get used to it. But now I can't even imagine going, going back would be awful, I think. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. It, it definitely is an improvement, uh, more more of a modern kind of way to play it. Yeah, man. 100 percent i'm gonna have to look up this snake versus monkey game because if it has stuff about ape escape like i y'all remember from the last metal gear solid 2 episode like i was lamenting i never got to play the skateboarding uh mini game on on that uh oil rig thing i can't remember the name of it um big shell whatever that was called at the room big shell thank you um but man, this sounds like it's kind of that redemption there of, of me getting to play that. <laughs> um, so let's kind of get into the game a little bit. Something I like to do at the start of these is for the plot synopsis, kind of just read what's on the back of the box and then kind of judge like, oh, is that pretty accurate? Is it different? You know, because Kojima does what Kojima does. <laughs> so I've got it pulled up here that says rival nations are secretly developing weapons that could threaten the future of mankind deep in the jungle. An elite soldier must combine stealth with survival to infiltrate the enemy and stop a weapon of mass destruction from triggering the largest full scale war the world has ever seen. Go behind enemy lines in this riveting story of peace, love and war from award winning director Hideo Kojima. And then some of the little bullet points it has in here is New Era, the 1960s, the Battle of Ideologies, Relive History as the Cold War and Geopolitical Landscape Change, which it takes place like right in the middle of all that. New Gameplay Survival, Outsmart Enemies with Camouflage, Close Quarters Combat, Stalking, Interrogating, Climbing, Hunting, and Treating Injuries. And the new setting, which is the Jungle... It says, pitch yourself against an environment where traps catch enemies and prey, threats lurk in the shadows, and noises alert predators. And the last two bullet points it has is epic musical score composed by Harry Gregson Williams, known for Shrek. <laughs> That's a weird one to start off with. <laughs> known for Shrek. <laughs> oh, man. It's just funny how it lists these because it's like he's known for Armageddon, The Rock, and Shrek. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember Armageddon for sure. <laughs> Oh, man. That's what it is. Um, fun fact. Sorry, Armageddon reminds me of the thing that NASA did with their uh, – they just finished this project to, like, launch projectiles to asteroids to see if they can divert them from going in – from hitting the Earth. You'll, you'll have to no, look it up. No. I'll try to put it in the show notes if you can look it up. <laughs> um it says, shed your skin and blend into any area by downloading new camouflage uniforms. So it had some DLC there. Ooh, looks like download them. PS2 of all things. It's kind of – there's something I think – I know I forget a lot is that the PS2 at some at one point had like an online thing building into it, it was so calm and then yeah I didn't know this took advantage of it, it had but. that uh, network drive you could attach to it you had to buy yeah. the peripheral That's what it was. It, yeah uh, late in the generation you could get that bad boy and, and play some play some online yeah yeah man good stuff well I'm gonna let y'all know at this point this is the spoiler zone okay so we're gonna get into some things I'm gonna go back over something I I couldn't mention at the beginning of the uh, fun fact section because it deals with a plot point. And uh, so, yeah, if you don't want any part of this game spoiled, I know it came out years ago. You know, if you don't care for spoilers, you can keep listening. If you don't want it spoiled, I would say go play this game, um, but it's still delisted. So you can't, you know, 
the only way you can play it is if you get Metal Gear Solid Legacy Collection or if you get subsistence for your uh, PlayStation or your Xbox or, you know, so you got to find a physical copy. Um, but digitally, uh, probably not going to find it. But just know that this game is dope. You need to play it. And let's get into some spoiler things. So one of the things I couldn't mention earlier dealt with who you actually play as because Kojima kept the true identity of Snake being Big Boss a huge secret. And I didn't know this because when I played it, when I played these games, it was very far removed from when they were actually released. So I wasn't there for the the zeitgeist sort of thing where everybody was playing at the same time. And then we realized like, oh, this is Big Boss. Um, and I didn't really notice that until I was going through like some YouTube comments on uh, a couple different videos I was watching. And even some people were like, I didn't know this was Big Boss until like close to the end of the game. And I'm like, how did you not? I was like, you know what? They never refer to him as really anything other than like snake or maybe boss. No, no, it's just because boss is the boss. Yeah. And they don't call him big boss until the end. So yeah, no, it's just <clears throat> snake. So for all we knew, this was, you know, a young solid snake for all we knew. Uh, of course they refer to him as naked snake in the game because he goes in without any tools or support. So he's, he's, you know, naked snake because of that. But man, I, I didn't know that. I, completely didn't catch it you guys played this a little probably a little bit closer to when it released than what i did did you guys have any idea about that did you, was that a twist for you jonathan let's kick it to you first the, the marketing was heavy on snake is back because the whole thing with you know everybody playing is riding in part two everybody mm-hmm. was disappointed so you see all these mm-hmm. ads and it's like you're playing this snake again everybody's like yes 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 but then Kojima had in his hand, like, well, it's not Solid Snake, you know, so I'm still going to kind of trick you. But with it mm-hmm. taking place so early on, you know, time-wise, I knew that there was something up, like, you know, early on. So I, yeah. I initially assumed that, you know, you'd be playing as, you were playing as Big Boss, and they were kind of, you know, doing mm-hmm. like a flashback. Yeah, I was trying to think back to the coverage leading up to it because I very much was in that zeitgeist. Uh, Obviously a big fan of Metal Gear Solid 1 and 2. So when 3 came out, it was ready to rock and roll. I don't remember that being a big thing like Raiden was for Metal Gear Solid 2. I I, I think kind of like Jonathan said, I feel like I just assumed it because we knew it was in the 60s. And so I don't think any of us thought that it could have been Solid Snake. I don't know if we just thought it was Big Boss or that was an assumption or what we thought. I don't remember exactly. Uh, What I do remember thinking, though, was that I was majorly bummed out. And Jonathan, tell me if you felt any of these sort of similar thoughts, because I wanted the sequel to Metal Gear Solid 2. They where they mm. left that, I was not satisfied. They're going to going after the Patriots, all this stuff with riding on board now. And then they flash back to the 60s. And I'm like, wait you got a story to finish here. Let's keep going. Why are we doing this? And it felt really like we were set back and it's like, okay, why are we doing this? I, I was very turned off by all that at first until I played the game, even in the midst of playing it. I'm like, this isn't solid snake. I don't, don't, this isn't this this camo (laughs) stuff. I'm not feeling it as much as I thought I might be Uh, we'll we'll get to some other things about that in a little bit later. But at first, that was my first impressions was I wanted a Metal Gear Solid 2 sequel, and this wasn't it. That's kind of yeah. the way the first, like, the, leading up to the release and then the first few hours of playing it, that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, no, that that's actually a good segue into the story, which is something we can talk about because that is a, a huge shift. You know, as you mentioned at the end of Metal Gear Solid 2, you learn about the Patriots, you learn about kind of what they're trying to do to control information and essentially, uh, you know, control people as, as an outcome of that. And so you're going after him. And uh, this this one really, like, it takes you back, but, and you don't really notice until you play the game, it kind of builds a foundation for you to kind of understand who the Patriots are and how they got to be where they're at. So you kind of understand what it was you're fighting. And um, and it's kind of, it's definitely different. When I was researching this game, and even as I was playing it again, I was like, this game is very much the anti Metal Gear Solid 2. Like it it really felt like Kojima was trying to kind of course correct and fix things, but normally when people spend a lot of time to try and do that, it doesn't really go that well. But with this game it works super well. Uh, in my opinion. It kind of makes me think of how, you know, when Star Wars The Last Jedi, sorry to trigger some of our listeners by just merely mentioning that movie. <laughs> You know, when that released and then they released the movie after that, that I can't remember what it's even 
called? It's Rise like, of Skywalker. Rise of is that what it is? Yeah. Okay, um, that one was trying to course correct from the previous movie, but it wound up trying to do too many things at once, and it's like this is just kind of meh at this point. This game is like no, we're we're backtracking a little bit on Metal Gear Solid Two, but trying to give you a better foundation of what's going on and why the, these people exist. And they, I think they did a really good job of kind of really just, and you guys let me know if, if, if you disagree with this or, or agree with it. I felt like the story was more to the point, like more back to metal gear solid one in regards to like, it's just kind of a straightforward story while building things up that happen in metal gear solid two to give you an idea of like, Oh, okay, this is what, was going on. This is who the Patriots are. And this is what, this is how they came out of the philosophers, which we'll break down a little bit later. But Michael, what about you, man? Did you feel like the story was definitely more straightforward this time through, or was it just kind of, yes. was it still kind of convoluted or no, you know, no, kind of that, share your thoughts on that. that? That's what eventually got me. Of course, you know, when I got to the end um, and, and we'll get there and I'm going to talk about it now, but once I saw the whole picture, I was like, man, that was Boy, it just that, that yes, it was more to the point. It was way less convoluted than Metal Gear Solid Two. That was um, one of the nice surprises com- comparing three to two. And it's, it's so funny saying what I just said about how I was kind of disappointed in the direction they were going in, and mm-hmm. I wasn't feeling necessarily the '60s in the jungle camo healing yourself. I wasn't necessarily feeling all that, but all that just slowly started washing away as you continued to play the game. You continue to go through the different boss battles and the story started to reveal itself. And like you said, Logan, to, to the point, it, it was in I mean, there is mystery and intrigue and stuff going on, but there, it was it was much more to the point. It was kind of mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> it was a little bit more understandable, um, you know, upon first uh, upon first playthrough. You know, we, when you finish Metal Gear Solid 2, I feel like a lot of us are like, OK, let me go back and replay that again. At the end of this right. one, I think you'll pretty much grasp everything pretty, pretty wholly. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on it there. Yeah, right on. Jonathan, what about you? I felt exactly like, um, <clears throat> like Michael felt as far as how he explained how he felt playing it. You know, it felt like they washed their hands of the second one, you know, and it's just like, here's, here's yeah. Snake is back, whole new set. And I'm like, wait a minute, you had this killer scene at the end after the credits and, you know, Ocelot says, you know, I found the Patriots, but they've been dead for X amount of years. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I can't wait for the sequel. And then it's like, all that's gone. You know, who's, who's singing, who's paramedic, (laughs) who cares about them? Like, I didn't appreciate the game until after I played through it, beat it, you know, years of playing it. And then when part four Mm -hmm. came out, a lot of the reveals they made three had such a, such a heavy place. And then your just mind is blown. Like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it, you know, um, the story I do feel w- was very straightforward, you know, um, Kojima definitely did take that criticism and feedback from the second one to heart that you can tell. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's like a self-contained story, you know, and most of the time it's, yeah. history kind of confuses me or it, it, it might bore me or there, there was a time in my life where it did. But as I was like watching the, uh, the video to prepare for the show and listening to the to the stories and stuff, I was like, man, this is pretty interesting and how everything kind of just yeah. combined and, and went together. So I definitely feel that this was a more straightforward uh, story than the previous one. Yeah. And I guess before we even go any further, I guess I can go, we can go even deeper into the story. Like what, how, what actually happens in this game and the game starts off with you playing a snake or this game scared me. I'm going to see if I can splice this in for the YouTube video because I clicked, you know, I like metal gear solid too. And when snake jumped out of the the airplane to jump in and, and start and initiate the virtuous mission, uh, he landed in the forest, took his, his helmet off, and there was Raiden right there. I'm like, what the – wait a minute. What the heck is going on right now, Kojima? I don't remember this, man. What are you doing? Um, and he radios in to Major Zero, who he goes by Major Tom at that point. And all I could literally think of was the song Major Tom to Ground Control. I should stop singing on the show, but I'm probably not at this point. You guys have heard me sing Bruno Mars online. But – and then he, and then Major Tom was like, "You can take off your mask now. Uh, it's totally fine uh, for the mission." And he takes off, and there's Snake. And I'm like, "Okay, oh my gosh, that scared me a little bit because I couldn't remember how this game started off." Um, 
But he goes into the Zero Mission. He's sent in to rescue um, this scientist named Sokolov who dealt with some sort of stuff. You don't really know a whole lot at that point of kind of like what he worked on. You just know you're supposed to go in and rescue him. Uh, you're working for the CIA. And as you go in to rescue him, the mission basically gets turned on its head. The um, snake's uh, mentor, the boss, shows up and stops him from rescuing Sokolov. You see the Cobra unit come in, which is, um, oh my gosh, there's the, I'm trying to think of who shows up, the pain, the fear, uh, the sorrow makes a bit of an appearance there. All of them. Um, and I'm, the end just is all of them too. are there. Yeah. And that's when you meet uh, General Volgan uh, as well. Actually, you run into Ocelot and, do you run into Ocelot and Eva in the Virtuous Mission? Or yes. is that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, excuse me. Um, in Just the virtuous Ocelot, mission, I, I think you run into him in the in, in yeah in the other one. Okay. Yeah, Eva. So yeah, Eva, you, you, sorry, Eva's in the second one. Ocelot's in the first one. Yes, that's right. Because Eva shows up at the end because she's okay. Okay, now I'm getting it corrected. Um, so you get introduced to like all the villains right there, and it's it's a pretty awesome scene. Like it's it's the first time where the game like makes you feel like oh yeah you're you're a rookie you are early Snake. Um, and so basically one thing leads to another Sokolov gets taken back. Um, snake gets totally disgraced and beaten up by the boss. Um, and as they're flying away in the helicopter, Volgan takes out this, I forget the exact name of the warhead, David Crockett, but it's I like think. this nuke that they were working on. Davy Crockett. Thank you. That's what it is. And he blows up Sokolov's lab. And then that creates a whole chain reaction where, uh, the Russians are mad at the U S government and they're like, this is your fault. You're in, you're in on this. Like, no, we had nothing to do with it. That's totally uh Volgan. And they're like, well, to prove your innocence, you need to come in here and like do this and this and this in order to clear your name. And one of those things to do is to, uh, was it, it's rescue Sokolov, but also take out boss. Um, cause that's basically who they said was, was part of it. So at that point, it's kind of mind blowing because you have all this stuff going on. You have snake going in. He finds out his mentor basically turned over to the Russian side. You have Sokolov going back to the Russian side. You have Volgan using a nuke that puts America or the U S government in hot water. And that just sets off the events of the game. And so then it takes place a week after the virtuous mission where snake is sent in to help clear uh, the U S government's name of all this. And that's when you meet some more characters. We get an early ocelot, which can we take a moment to appreciate young, just what's the word I'm looking for? Just young and like uh, arrogant Ocelot and his whole little row and his little hand signs that he Ocelot was one of my, he stole the show for this game for me, man. How did you guys feel about Ocelot? Michael, let's start with you. Yeah, it, it was great getting a young Ocelot who, like you said, is so arrogant. He thinks he knows a lot and he does. But, man, he yeah. doesn't know as much as Snake, and Snake really schools him a, a bunch early on. So much to that you can see as the game goes on, he starts to, like, he wants to learn as much about Snake as possible. He wants to almost mimic him and kind of, there's lots of things he respects about him. <clears throat> Obviously, he, like, takes his advice on switching to a, a single-action mm -hmm. army, you know, a six-shooter, things like that. Yep. Um, so it's very interesting getting this, this young Ocelot. You, we know what a absolutely major critical role he plays in the yep. rest of the series so seeing this version is um it's almost like a a, a a sneak peek behind the curtain or something it's sort of it's just nice to get this other sort of uh angle at the character yeah yeah jonathan what about you yeah it was such a fan service i mean it, it really says you know how much people really liked us a lot and you know in the first yeah. game and then the second because in the first game you know he, he was a major player he was one of the bad guys but it wasn't until right. like after the credits you're like whoa and then in the second one he has a heavier role and so you know the fact that kojima brought him back you know early in his his career so you can kind of see you know where he came from and because even when it was one part in the game where uh something happened he started clapping and it made me think about how in the uh, in the earlier in the other games he would do that that kind of slow clap like that, and I was just like, ah, you know, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, this, this role, so. th this game too. Also, real quick, uh, Logan is you know talking about the the full story and kind of going back to the '60s and well, why did it do this? It, it's almost we didn't realize it, but it was it was almost a necessity. You know, you, you see yeah. how critical of a role Ocelot played in Metal Gear Solid Three and who he was. This like triple agent kind of he and eva you know all these crazy like triple crossing 
espionage so spy stuff going on. And, and so you, you get, you know, it's like we have to have this set up. Like so much of it explains and, 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 and uh, speaks to other things that happen in the series. Um, so while it's almost like we, some of us, me, I'm, I'm talking to, went kicking and screaming into MGS3. By the end, we're like, oh, this is why this makes so much more sense. Having this background of this character and Big Boss and Ocelot and where he came from. So many things. It, it informs the rest of the series. It makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's just super good. Um, but through a series of events, I mean, you, you learn kind of more about what Sokolov's working on, uh, which is the Shagohod, which is like a very early... I don't even really. Would you guys call this thing a Metal Gear? Because it's basically yeah. just kind of like a giant tank. Would, I would. would you guys still call it a Metal yeah, Gear? Yeah, very early. Okay. And I was. I even made a note here. It almost, it makes sense. You know, again, that it's in the sixties. That this thing is not as impressive as Metal Gear Rex and Metal Gear yeah. Ray. It just you need to look at technology and where it makes sense. I, I remember thinking, looking at the Shagohod the first time, and I was like, oh, that's kind of yeah, whatever. It's not Metal Gear Ray. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like this anime cool looking kind right. of thing. Um, yeah. but that makes sense. But yeah, it's a hundred percent. Like it's like the first Metal Gear, um, developed by um Granin, the guy that yeah. Snake talked to, who was all getting drunk and stuff. And he eventually, in that <laughs> scene, he was talking about how he was going to uh, give his secrets to his American friend, which was um Otacon's dad. Uh, yeah. Uh, Did you see that the, picture? The, in the back? Uh, Emmerich Senior. What I forget his name. Here we are. Um, so was. yeah, yeah. So that's how. That's how all that. That's how Metal Gear Rex became a thing, and and the first Metal Gear Solid yeah. is because Granin sent that information out before he got killed by Volgan. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That was one of the things I, I remember. That scene where Snake's talking to Granin, and like, first of all, Granin's office is cool because it has like several. It has like a Metal Gear Ray on the bookshelf. There's a Metal Gear Rex next to it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, there's that giant robot from Zone of the Enders on the back thing too. And yep. I'm like, dude, there's so many cool things in here that I'm seeing. But when I saw that picture of him with uh, Otacon's dad, I was like, that's right. That's how they start making the Metal Gears because he sends the plans to him. It's funny, like some of the stuff, like there's things I remember about this game, but when I was playing through it again, I was like, man, there's there's still things I totally forgot about this. So yeah. that was kind of cool. I was like, oh, that's that's cool to make that connection again. Um, they, sorry, I have on my notes here that they, <laughs> Snake says something about Granin's shoes being nice, and so Granin's like, "Oh, I gotta, I gotta repay you for the compliment." He's like, "What compliment about my shoes?" And he like tells him how to get into this lab and stuff. I'm like, "Gosh, dang it, Kojima! I love how goofy this game well, is." Well, there's a thing there uh, with the shoes too. There's a certain codec conversation um, where basically they were hiding the the KGB or maybe someone like that, some group like that was testing like transmitters or like tracking things or putting putting them in the heel of a, of a shoe. And I think there was something in that shoe, uh, Mm. which is why they focused on it. No, you mentioned that there was a a cutscene. It's either before or after you fight Volgan, um, uh, near the Shagohod. And I think Ocelot pulls the shoe up and like swip, he like swipes the heel part out mm-hmm. and then there's a transmitter in there. Mm-hmm. Um, because either Eva or boss was like tracking his location or something like that. Or maybe it was Volgan, but yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up because that was something I totally missed. Mm-hmm. Um, I can go through the rest of the story. It just, real brief synopsis of it just kind of just getting through everything is you learn about the philosophers who was i wrote it down on my notes here um is that it was set up by the three great powers during both world wars it was by um you guys will have to correct me if i get it wrong but it was by the u.s china and i believe was it europe or russia it was russia yeah so was it russia okay um and so they put uh, together it was basically like a hundred billion dollars it was just like a ton of money um, that they were using. And then after those, they were supposed to divide them back up. But then that's where the philosopher's legacy, that's what it's called, um, was basically taken. Volgan has it and he's been using it to fund the Shagohod and build it. But then that's where you get Ocelot and Eva being triple agents and they were sent in to try and take the philosopher's legacy. And so there's a whole thing there. It's, it's very much a spy espionage type of game. Like it is very heavy into that it goes into that so it shies away from the sci-fi stuff that we're used to in metal gear solid 2 to go back into the spy stuff that we're used to from metal gear solid 1 like i said metal gear solid 3 is very much the antithesis to metal gear solid 2 um 
But yeah, so we'll get into that some more as well. I want to read this right in first from our dear editor who writes, and it says, Metal Gear Solid 3 was the first Metal Gear that I actually played by myself from start to finish. I had watched my buddy play the first two, and when I finally got my hands on it, I realized that this was pretty close to my ideal game style. Mostly hiding, lots of sniping, and an engaging if slightly convoluted (laughs) storyline. Sorry, I just saw the last line. Slightly convoluted storyline left me wanting more and really cemented my belief that Kojima's storyline made me able to understand Kingdom Hearts. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, to that. (laughs) I think I think I made Skinner like uh, explain the plot to Kingdom Hearts in under like a minute or something a couple episodes ago. Y'all have to go look that up. Maybe it was a patch notes. I can't remember. Um but yeah, so I wanted to touch on because we talked about the story and stuff, but we got to talk about the gameplay because this is there's aspects of it that's the same as the last two, but in the same way, it really changes a lot. You're in the forest now. You're using camouflage. You're treating your own injuries in its own sub menu. Um, there's a lot more nuances to the gameplay of how you can attack enemies. I was telling um, the guys here in the pre-show that the fight with the fear, who's kind of like a spider toad actually if you know who toad is from the x-men he kind of reminds me of that a little bit with the long tongue and the climbing and all yeah. that you can leave out poison food not poison food but like old food that's molded in the game and he'll eat it and he'll be like oh what is this and then he'll actually get poisoned and start losing health based off that there's little tricks like that to the gameplay that really makes this a, a sandbox in the sense of gameplay and so he kind of uh, uh, Skinner brought up some of those things, but John, let's kick it to you, man. What did you think of the, I guess the upscaling of the gameplay in the, in the fleshing it out and adding some more things. What I'm curious to know from you two is how you felt about treating your injuries and doing the camouflage. If that was annoying to you, that was one thing you can touch on, but what are, what all did you think about the gameplay itself? Jonathan, let's start with you. I loved it. You know, it, it, I thought it was really fun. It was it was yeah. a, a huge change of pace. And like you said, all the little quirks that Kojima did, like if uh, your character was poisoned and you go to the uh, to the menu screen and you spin them around in the 3D view and keep <laughs> yes. turning them and then unpause it <laughs> yeah. and you'll throw up. I mean, that's yeah. genius, you know. Uh, so, I mean, I, I thought it was cool finding the different camouflages and, you know, uh, start kind of going out of my way to find different items. And then, you know, mm-hmm. being able to, to hide under the leaves and it's like, oh, my gosh, like they're right in yeah. front of me and they're walking around. So, you know, it, it was cool because being outside so much was such a a vast difference from being, you know, strictly, you know, inside buildings or been inside the boat, you know, being around technology and stuff. And so when I found my first like structure or building playing the game, I was like, oh my gosh, it's like, it's a building, there's a door, like, you know, who's in here, what am I going to yeah. find, you know, hiding under beds and stuff like that, and then, okay, it's back to the, back to the grass and back to the dirt, so, you know, I, it was a change of pace, and it was pretty different, but I think just mm-hmm. at the time on the PS2, just the, the the attention to detail that Kojima had just was so mind-blowing to me, it's crazy. Yeah. Micah, what about you? Yeah, what comes to mind for me was the introduction of CQC which was the first for, <laughs> yeah. for Metal Gear Solid 3. One of my favorite aspects about the original Metal Gear Solid um, was like just coming up behind someone and just choking them out. Like that was so new and novel. Like you didn't have stealth games and just <laughs> like just doing that period. Like I love just like going up to someone on urinal, boom, you're mine, choke you out. And then Metal Gear <laughs> Solid 2 like using the train gun and sneaking up behind them and like, you know, like stick them up, you know, like you freeze and like, you know, they'll go and mm-hmm. take their dog tag. All those types of interactions. So CQC was like an extension of that, like to the nth degree, where you had so many combinations of what you could do when you got a guy, when you grabbed a guy, use him as a shield, throw him down, punch him, choke him, knife him, all sorts of different avenues. It's like a, it's like a dialogue tree off of like you grab you, you grab your guy, and then you have a dialogue tree. Oh, he want to do this, you want to do this, you want to do that, you want to do this, yeah. and um, it, that was really cool and neat. <clears throat> and I was kind of panning the whole camouflage stuff at first but that as the game went on that's what like i was obsessed with it obsessed with keeping that percentage as high as humanly possible Mm -hmm. gotta be over 90 or else i ain't doing it (laughs) i would look ridiculous (laughs) like completely like black face paint all black suit because like i'm in the shadows and like this is the best and then 10 seconds later i'm swapping to something completely different because that's what the (laughs) background is i was kind of obsessive with changing out the camo so that i would always be peak uh camouflaged 
Um, so, so that was a fun aspect collecting all of those things. And, and Jonathan, you touched on it all the, this in watching the, the replay I, I watched on YouTube, it introduced so many different kind of ways to go about taking out bosses. That I didn't even realize existed. Um, one neat one that I told Logan at the beginning, I think Jonathan, before you hopped on was in the boss battle with Volgan, where you kind of drop down the elevator and Ocelot's watching you. You know, that's right after he you were like impersonating um, that uh, that general that looked like Raiden, that uh, yeah. R- Raidanovich Rykov or something like that. That's what it's not. Yeah, if you um, not. if you put on that mask of the Raiden mask while you're fighting Volgan, he's like, Ivan, and he like stops and pauses, <laughs> and you can just take him out while he's like distracted by you looking like him. You can't do the whole boss fight, but you can put it on. He's distracted and you can get a, a pop shot in. So little things like that. He's Kojima's man. He's all over the place with the ways that you can. I saw guys like with bosses. He was like waving the handkerchief around. He had that handkerchief and just like waved around their face and like they would get knocked out. Things like that. It's like why I would never have thought to face a boss like that. Um, So a lot of neat little touches of ways that you can creatively take out bosses and enemies was just through the roof. Like we thought there was cool things that did in MGS2, but they took it to an even higher degree in this game yeah yeah definitely. absolutely well mia because that actually leads into uh <laughs> portra i appreciate you shortening your name on there so we don't mess with it uh <laughs> or try to mispronounce it um uh, Portra writes in and says, I remember playing the demo for this, which came with the official PlayStation magazine, Australia. I was 14 and had never heard of or played Metal Gear Solid being an N64 lad. Represent, man. I was too. Uh, the demo was the entirety of the Virtuous Mission, and it blew me away. I borrowed it from Video City. Do you remember when we had video stores and we could rent games and stuff from there? Oh, man. <laughs> so I was reading that. I had a nice little trip to... Uh, back when I was renting games from the uh, video store. It was a good time. Um, He says, I borrowed it from Video City and played it, not just for the invent of gameplay, but for the movie that unfolded as you played it. Such nutty bosses, deep characters, and pretty much James Bond-inspired game, which which Kojima does love. First game that I would replay consecutively and the first and only game to make me cry. We'll get to that here in a second. Also, best ladder climbing section ever. Amen, dude. I So... I rec- again, I recorded my entire playthrough of this, and I showed my wife that ladder scene, and she's like, how long is this? La- it just keeps, how long is this ladder? Why is it so big? And then when I got to the top of the ladder, Snake threw up, and she was like, wait, does that really happen? And I'm like, I think it's because I ate some like poison snakes before I made the climb, <laughs> but I got the achievement for Ralph called, so it, it is what it is. <laughs> but... I wanted to, <laughs> that ladder scene is so stink, and then it plays the thing. Oh, it's iconic. The ladder scene's awesome. Yeah, it's really it good. Really it's really good. If y'all want a little taste of it, go over to the YouTube channel. There's a short of what happened when I played the game. You can go check it out for yourself. It's just, I think like twenty or thirty seconds, so you don't get the full experience. But it's oh my gosh, it's so good. Um, I want to talk about this game's bosses because. We talked about how Metal Gear Solid 2, like the bosses were, were kind of okay, but not quite as memorable as the first game. In my opinion, I think these are my favorite set of bosses in any of the Metal Gear games. They're all, they're so cool, but so bonkers that it's just like you have a guy that sh- is shooting a hornet out of his mouth at you. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what? So let's do the typical discussion when we get to this favorite bosses what did we think of them things like that michael let's start it off with you yeah i'm, I'm with you this has definitely improved over metal gear solid 2's bosses i still hold the bosses uh in metal gear solid 1 higher than this slew mm-hmm. i think mm-hmm. um the pain and the fear are the main culprits in my opinion um they're they've they've got some they're, they're, they're definitely on that nutty kojima side but the actual fights themselves excuse me i didn't think we're particularly compelling um okay. uh, but the all all the rest are, are really high up there um especially the end the the yes. boss fight with the sniper this in my opinion is probably my second favorite metal gear solid boss fight behind psycho mantis um mm-hmm. the way this is laid out it's over three large areas of the map you know in metal gear games you kind of like you go from one kind of area or one room i would say to another and you know when you go to different areas so it it takes place not in one section like you would normally traditionally have a boss fight like some sort of arena or like a circle or whatever like you got to go to different sections and track this guy down 
And another thing that's also neat about it is that it doesn't even have to take place at all. You can 100% yeah. skip this boss fight. <laughs> so cool. If earlier <laughs> in the game there is a section by the docks where Volgan and I think Tatiana and uh, Sokolov and, and the end all come out and they're talking and – Snake is watching them from afar through the binoculars. And at the end of the cutscene, one of the soldiers grabs the end who's sitting in a wheelchair and kind of wheels him back inside. If you can whip out your sniper rifle and shoot him, you can just go ahead and kill him right then and there while he's being wheeled in and yeah. you don't have to fight him. That yeah. is. Yeah, that's amazing. It's pretty wild. No, no one does that. No one yeah. does that. And, and yeah. especially back then, I, I keep saying that, that that kind of stuff when it comes to these Metal Gear games. I keep saying how no one has done these things. It's because no one did. Like, it's easy to yeah. look back, you know, 16, 18 years later. And like, well, dude, they did just – no, brother, no. No one was doing this stuff, I, I guarantee you. And like, not even yeah. close. Right. And so um, that was cool. And you, know, you get a whole different scenario – once you do get to the end fight, if you take him out earlier, you got this whole different like situation where you got to fight some regular soldier snipers or something like that. They have something mm -hmm. for you, but you just don't fight the end. Um, yeah. I, I keep I'm kind of squatted on this boss fight because I love it so much. There's some other good ones. Mm -hmm. The Fury, I think, is excellent as well. Um, the fight with Volgan, obviously the fight. The Fury, with the, the Fury is the space one with the flamethrower, right? He's Correct. got the astronaut suit. Okay, okay. Yeah, sure. yeah. I, I like that fight a lot. It reminds me a little bit of Vulcan Raven MGS One a little bit. Um, oh yeah. Uh, but yeah, and obviously the the iconic fight with the boss at the end can be understated as well. Yeah. I'll stop. I'll let Jonathan uh, say, say a little bit about some bosses here. <laughs> no, I mean I, I echo your sentiments. The boss fight was. It was, I don't know if you guys realize this, but like if you put like a mine or something down on the ground, she'll walk over and dismantle it. And you'll see like the pieces yep. of it just like fly, fly, fly apart. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? I didn't me? know like, that. It is the, the little things with her is just, it's amazing. You know, she'll see CQC you to the ground. And I mean, yep. you just see how efficient of a soldier she is. You know, when you do fight her, I, I can imagine if we had a game where we played as her, that would have been like crazy. Um, I love the Ocelot fight, the one where uh, I think because like if you shoot the bees down from the tree or the wasp or something, they'll fall on his yeah. head and they'll start, you know, flinging mm -hmm. them around. And you can shoot at them. I mean, it's there's so many uh, great, you know, boss scenarios and stuff. I, I So I'd probably have to say the boss and the end were probably my favorite, too. Yeah. Yeah. The end definitely sticks out, just stands out for me. Even playing this again, I'm like, this is such a cool boss fight. And there's ways you can break it. If you put on the thermal goggles, you can see his footprint. So it makes it easier to find him. But I I didn't even think about that during this. I was like, I'm, I'm going to try and actually like snipe him. Right. But then I, as I was playing, I was like, oh, yeah, I think you can kill him with time in this. Right. So. For those who maybe don't know or didn't try this, if you go into your settings on your console and set it for it, I think it's like a week or two, <laughs> and then come back into the fight, you'll it'll open up with a cutscene of him walking up on on the end, and he's sitting there with a, holding his gun, and Snake's like, "Put your hands up," and then he just falls over dead, and he's like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> he dies about of that. old age. I forgot about that. That's <laughs> so good. Like like Micah said, no one's doing this in games. And I'm just like, this is so fun. And what's funny is, is if you do that, not only do you not get the achievement for the game, but Major Zero calls in and is like, what are you what are you doing? Well, I mean, it, it, it is what it is. You know, this isn't a game, Snake. You know, this is war. <laughs> a little third wall, breaking the fourth wall there. And Snake's like, well, his final word, he wanted to face me in man-to-man -man combat as a last uh last wish thing and then it's just dude the 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 like little codec call i'm gonna call it that radio call whatever that you get from it is so funny yeah i might upload it to the youtube channel at some point or put it in the discord server because again i played through it and then when i saw i didn't get the achievement i was like ah oh, screw this i'll go back and get the <laughs> beat him the legit way so i can get the achievement man it's again like micah said people people weren't doing this man it it is so 
stinking cool. That's why these bosses kind of stand out to me a little bit. I didn't even make the connection that the the Fury was kind of an echo of the Vulcan Raven fight. And I'm like, now that I think about it, yeah, it's almost exactly like it. It's just with a flamethrower now instead of a minigun. Like, it's it's so stinking cool. I will say, you know, Micah said that one of the boss fights from one of the previous games is Buns. I'm going to pull out the Buns card and say that the... Uh, that last fight where like Eva's distracting the Shagohod and you're trying to shoot it in that like little closed off zone thing, I'm like, this is this is buns, dude. I don't <laughs> I don't care for this at all. This is it is what it is. I mean, it's fine for what it is, but I'm just like this. I I don't care for it personally. Everything else I've really enjoyed, but yeah, that that final fight with the boss is like it's it's definitely pretty gut wrenching when you kind of like when you feel the weight of it. And especially the cutscene that follows after, and uh, just the the monologue oh. that the boss has beforehand about like why she got into this, Amazing. and um, man, it's uh, this game is very goofy. I was watching uh, Super Bunny Hops um, critical close up of this game, and he calls it like you know it, it is very campy. But there's a point where the game like because it's so campy, it starts like hitting the serious notes, and it hits so effectively that it's like. I mean, like you guys said, at the end of the game, I think Micah said he he, he cried at the end. Porcho said that he cried. The person who did the um, – the lady who did the motion capture for the boss, when she got to that scene at the end and she was reading the script, she broke down into tears wow. because of how sad and beautiful it was at the same time. And, man, I didn't notice this. We can kind of get into this, and this will lead into the themes, and we're – running a little long here um but um one of the things that super bunny hop pointed out in his critical close-up is that after eva tells the big boss or tells boss about the boss and what she was doing and how she didn't let boss in on or didn't let snake in on any of this stuff to kind of protect you know just do her job as a soldier snake doesn't say a word for the rest of the game until he like just has sheds a single tear um, at the boss's grave, which by the way, if you there's hidden like R one button prompts in the game, if you do that at the grave, it'll switch to snakes vision and it'll be super blurry because of his tears. And it's just like, again, Kojima who's doing stuff like this back in this time. Nobody, man, like this is, peak storytelling i don't care if people disagree with me or not people are already mad at me for saying the dead space cover art's boring i'll say that this game is peak storytelling it's well um, it's super yeah, good th- this is where i gotta jump in and 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 speak my piece this is what propels this game and is so high on my list i, I think um I've, I've talked a lot about how metal gear solid one and shadow of the colossus are kind of my 1a and 1b favorite games ever no. this is number three Metal Gear Solid 3, I think, is number three for me. It's my favorite game of all time. And it's because of the story. It's because of the character of the boss and her self-sacrifice and what she does. Um, You know, of course, many of you obviously know, and and Logan's broken down some of the synopsis already. But basically, because everything hinged on when Volgan shot that atomic bomb at Sokolov's facility. Eva, like Eva explains in the game, that changed everything. Like the rules yeah. had to be rewritten. The, the the mission had to be altered. And the the plan was that the boss is going to defect to go get the philosopher's legacy for the Americans and that she would come on mm-hmm. back after the defection. And yeah. um, but since that happened, the Russians required proof that the Americans weren't involved and didn't do that. You know, Volgan did it. Obviously, we all know that, but they don't they don't know that they thought maybe the Americans did it. And so we had to prove that. So, of course, you know, that's part of the mission is that snake has to go kill her. And she knows that the boss knows that that is her yeah. mission. Now that has become her mission is that snake is going to come and kill her. And that's that's what she has to do. And so she can't ever say anything to snake. She can't tell anybody, but she thankfully has this spy that comes along, Tatiana, Eva, um, that is working for China. It's, it's, it turned out the Chinese side of the philosopher's legacy trying to get their money. That was a twist. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. and basically she is the only one that she can trust because she's also double crossing Volgan and Ocelot and all these people. So she tells her to tell Snake and and Snake simply like like Logan said he can't even live with himself almost of, of what the sacrifice that she had she laid down 
everything that she knew and loved for the mission for her country. And like Eva said, it was, it was so well delivered. I got her name written down, the actress's name. Um, I think I have it written down who played Eva. Yeah. Suzetta Mignette, her monologue at the end, just as snake is walking up to the gravesite and everything, man. Oh, it was so beautiful. Um, yeah. the way that the boss and that character was written, the self-sacrifice involved was one of the most beautiful kind of self-sacrifice stories in fiction that I've encountered. Um, always sends me to tears. I, I just can't help it. As, as Eve is, Eve is explaining it and snake approaches that grave. I just can't, you think about what the boss did. You think about what she had to, she, the, like how bad she was biting her tongue. She couldn't say anything. She was going to be remembered. And, and like Eva says this, she was going to be remembered as a traitor by Americans yeah. and as a monster by Russians who shot a nuke at their, at the, at, at, at their own land. And that's yeah. how she was going to go down in history. And she accepted it and took it. And that's, like, that's incredible. Like a, that's awesome. like a boss, pun intended. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. There it is. So, so, so sorry if that took a minute. That is why I hold this game in such high regard. It was almost funny. Like I, yeah. I, I remember playing it for the first time. I get to the boss fight and I beat her and I'm like, that was good. But it didn't quite feel whole. And then you get that monologue at the end, almost like an epilogue mm. where it's like, this is where the info dump is. And it's like, holy moly, you're kidding me. It's, it's just yeah. everything became clear. And it's going back to the, the tightness of this story kind of it's, it's not so crazy and convoluted. They really wrapped nicely. And you, you understand the weight of what, what the boss does. And I, I don't know, say this real quick and I'll pass the baton. Every single scene that the boss is in, she carries that weight and gravitas in her character. Everyone fears yeah. her. Volgan, there's at one point where she like kind of comes up on Volgan and Volgan like backs off. There. No, no, yeah. no, no. I don't want yeah. any of your judo, as he called yeah. it at one point. <laughs> and like you don't mess with her. Everyone yeah. knows it. And and you can see it so well. They the way that Kojima and the development team did it, like when she was on the bridge and she defected, you could see it in her eyes, like she didn't want to do this. And she did yeah. every every scene that she interacted with Snake and Volgan, especially she was trying just so to make it make sure that snake lived because that was she mm -hmm. needed her mission to be accomplished was that i need him to kill me so i must keep him alive so there's all these opportunities she was saving snake from volgan and you could tell like she's uh, you could see the pain like there's one scene where um they're at the grozny grad facility and snake is caught and volgan's about to go bust up snake and she's walking out of the hallway and she's like looking down like mm, just like i can't believe i just did that i had to like leave him for that yeah. and, it, and it's, you can tell it's killing her yeah. Such a great character. One of my very favorite characters in all of video games is the boss. So, so good. Yeah. I would I would even go so far to say as uh, the boss is one of the best moms in video <laughs> games to a degree. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so because that's kind of what I mean, you if you've if you've never played the game and you're listening to this, you get a sense of that, that she is kind of a mother figure to Snake. And so like Micah was really put very well when she saw him being hurt and stuff she it, you could tell it hurt her and it just it goes to the writing and just the cinematography of this game it, it does feel like a movie and man it's it the the heavy moments hit really well and so it's crazy how this game manages to balance just goofiness with seriousness and just threads that needle perfectly throughout the whole game it's it's really something to kind of behold um, John, I didn't know if you had anything to add to that before I moved into this one thing about what the boss said. I, I just echo all your sentiments. I, I can't even really top that. You know, um, it, it, it was phenomenal. Uh, she's like you said, like the, the greatest mom in, in game and especially with the whole Ocelot thing as well. Just like, mm -hmm. It's just mind blowing, man. But no, nah, you, Micah said everything I, I was thinking and feeling. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and you kind of uh, notice something too, because as you're playing through the whole game, you're wondering, like, okay, this is the bad guy in this game. But at the by the end, you're like, I kind of I like this. I like Snake. And then when you see here he's big boss, you're like, oh crap, wait a minute. And you kind of notice he's kind of start he he started down that path to becoming a villain because after he gets that medal, he turns around and someone tries to shake his hand. And he just looks at him, and I'm like, 
you don't like any of this. You're not. I mean, I don't blame him. I mean, I don't no. blame him. It's when he realized that the government effectively screwed over his mentor and sent him in to kill her for really just to save face so that they didn't have to suffer the repercussions of their actions. And so that leads him on to becoming the big bad, you know, yeah. pun intended, of the series. But what's interesting is when there's moments where the boss um, encounters Snake and she she'll kind of go on these these monologues from time to time and you're like, what are you even talking about? There's a few that I wrote down here where she said a couple times that politics determine battles and yesterday's good is tomorrow's evil. And you're like, what is that? Wait, that kind of okay. That I don't like how that sounds, but I think you're right. She's basically talking about her own situation. You know, yesterday she was a good guy, but now she's the bad guy. And so it's because of all these politics that's playing with people's lives and determining battles that it's like, this isn't really okay, but this is my duty as a soldier. I'm going to do this. And it's just like, when you combine that with the boss's character itself, it's like, dude, this character is probably one of the best characters in all of gaming because of how she's dedicated to her job as a soldier and she's just got that humility. I don't know if humility is the right word that I'm looking for, but... She just she's got that poise. Well, she's it's she's just, so man, it, qualified. She obviously is yes. this killer as a soldier. She has mm-hmm. trained yes. up this whole Cobra unit. She developed CQC along with Snake. She's been to the yeah. stinking outer space, as she explains it to Snake at the end, because she body her body's already been irradiated. So they're doing all this experimental yeah. stuff, sending her to space. She's so qualified. And and that's what Snake hates at the end in the in the medal ceremony is this huge injustice. He's he's like, no, yeah. she is the hero. She's the one who did everything. She was the strong yeah. one. She was the one who sacrificed everything. She was the one who could that's going to be smeared for all eternity. And history is always going to look at her as a villain. She's the yeah. one that should get this medal, not me. And so, yeah, it felt yeah. like a big injustice to Snake. And um, like, like going back to what I said about how she commands kind of this this uh, this respect in every scene, you know, she's just so qualified. She, she, she talked about all the things she's done when you're first kind of early in the game and she's a Kodak partner. And then, yeah, you just learned so much about her. She's just uh, she's just awesome. She, she she's she's yeah. uh, she can kick your butt. And she's <laughs> she's self sacrificial. She, she's just the, kind of the whole package. She's awesome. So yeah. considering 100%. considering how everything played out, is Big Boss really a bad guy? Like, is he really a villain? Because one of the things that the game really made me look at is that you kind of base who's the bad guy based off of the side that you're on. You know, other perspective. You know, um, yeah. if you're on this side, you think that what you're doing is right. And your enemies also yeah. think the exact same thing. You know, I uh, was watching a documentary on YouTube about uh, these gangs in Long Beach, California. And you, you might look at them like, oh, these guys are gangbangers are doing this. But the history is about refugees coming over from Cambodia. And when you look at the mm. how it all started, you become very compassionate. You don't look at it like, oh, these guys are just criminals and gangbangers. You look at like, whoa, mm. this is how this started. They started these gangs to protect themselves from people that were coming against them. And then they, they split apart. Now they're rivals and their, their kids are doing it. So even knowing the things that you know, in the future games, you can kind of see like big boss, his whole mission, his whole, everything is just carrying on her legacy. And he's just like, so yeah. focused mm-hmm. on it, you know? So even the steps he takes in MGS five, the, you know, and the things that you learn about him in part four, you know, how he, t- he tells a uh, solid snake about, you know, the boss It's it's just like it, it gives you a lot of compassion for him. And at that scene where he's given the medal, the R1 doesn't pop up. But if you hit it, you see uh, Ocelot outside the window. Yep. And he's doing the little yep. thing with his hands. That is just so cool. Yeah, I, I don't know if Big Boss is a villain. Metal Gear is so complex with its factions and its, yeah. and its interested parties. I mean, even in just this game, you're talking about, you know, um, you know, three countries trying to get the philosopher's legacy. You got Russia, you know, or, you know, Volgan trying to keep it. You got the Americans trying to get it via the boss. You got the Chinese trying to get it via Eva. 
and there's just so many there's there's the you know there's khrushchev the actual leader of the soviets and you know and he's got a a beef with Volgan and his faction. And so there's all these factions, there's all these interested parties with varying degrees of, you know, morality or whatever, you know, so to paint big boss as just a villain, I think that'd be an oversimplification, especially like yeah. Jonathan said, when you see what has happened in Metal Gear Solid five and how outer heaven starts and how, what he's trying, what big boss is trying to do, um, with, um, with like master Miller and all those guys and stuff. Um, it's uh you 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 can see where the you, like, like I said this is setting up everything this is the beginning of everything in the Metal Gear yeah. universe so you can see you know the motivations you can see the history you can see why they're doing what they're doing and it's not just so cut and dry as you know Big Boss is this villain and Liquid Snake wants to revive his dream and he's a bad guy so Big Boss is bad and all this kind yeah. of stuff it's not that clear cut it's much more gray and this this game starts to give that context to some of that gray. Yeah, I remember when I'm glad y'all brought that up because it led me to to this thought here is I remember when I first beat this game um, years ago and I was just kind of like sitting back reeling, just taking it all in of like what I just experienced. And I was like, you know what? I kind of understand why Big Boss would become the bad guy, so to speak, because he's probably wondering if my government can do that to my mentor When's my number up? When are they going to do the same thing to me? And so there's a little bit of self-preservation in there where it's like, I'm going to protect myself first because I clearly can't trust this government anymore. And to be honest, I don't blame them. You know, I I know that may sound bad, but it's like, because he goes on to do some pretty, pretty crazy things. But I mean, after you see the events of this game and you see kind of what took place, because that's kind of the whole thing, you know. When you when you read history books, they're always written by the victor, and you never really see kind of the granular stuff that led to it. Sometimes, and when you see it, you're like, "Oh, this didn't go exactly the way that I thought it did." It's the same thing here, and you're like, "There's more to this than I thought," and I kind of get it now. Yeah, you know, I may not agree with his methods necessarily, but I totally understand. Like, because after what he went through. I mean, apart from, you know, my faith in Christ, I probably would go do the same thing. You know what I mean? That, <laughs> right. that sort of thing. Yeah. It's kind of like, uh, I don't want to get into spoilers for this, but like if you play The Last of Us, you kind of understand that end scene to a degree after you think about it for a little bit. I'm not going to go on there because I don't, I know people are playing the remastered one. And I don't want to spoil that, um, but I'll just say like, you kind of understand it. And so that's one of the things that I love about games as a whole is it puts you like you can read a book and get an idea for what a character is going through, but video games are unique because it puts you in the shoes of that character. So you literally walk a mile or several in their shoes to understand what's going on. You're like, oh, I get it. I get it. And so I don't know, man, this game blew my mind on so many levels when I played it. And it's like I said, it's, it's one of my favorite games of all time. It's definitely my favorite metal gear solid game, but it's, easily my favorite metal or favorite game of all time and playing through it again was just like I honestly wasn't sure how I was going to feel about it because the intro cutscene is like 30 minutes long I'm like oh my gosh Kojima you're starting me <laughs> off on a 30 minute cutscene okay but as I played more I'm like this game is so good the writing is so good the gameplay is so everything is stellar and I could literally keep going because I didn't even go through everything in my notes. <laughs> yeah, I, I have so many notes we didn't say that. Like I said, we're not going to get through everything. Uh, <sighs> just a quick thing. You just made me think of it. Best intro to a Metal Gear Solid game. Am I wrong? Most epic, that Halo jump. Yeah. Pretty cool. So cool. So cool. Yeah. And then that little tease there. If you select the I like Metal Gear Solid 2, he pulls up the match. <laughs> Wait, why is right in here? What's going on? <laughs> Kojima. <laughs> yeah, no, it... Just a quick a quick point we were talking about, you know, being invested in it, thinking about the sorrow fight really kind of puts you in that point. Like, yes, it was. I don't think it was until like maybe years later when, like, you know, the Internet was big. And, you know, I found out that if you didn't kill the people that you didn't kill, don't show up. And so the first time Mm -hmm. I played it, that part was super long for me because everybody I came across, I killed. And then when you realize, like, whoa, like, if I trank these guys, you know, if I don't kill anyone or try my best not to kill anyone, there's going to be fewer, you know, people that I encounter 
on this and that was just and then you take the uh, then you die and then you have to revive yourself with the it, it was just like it, it's, it's insane like Kojima to me this game is like a uh, like his magnum opus you know it's just like yeah. the if someone asked me about you know video games the, the format and you know how it's a quality form of entertainment I would use this game as an example you know storytelling quality yeah. the time that it came out I mean it was just ahead of head of so many ahead of everything you know I'm, yeah. I mean I think to this day there's still not people that really do like these little quirks and and things within the games like Kojima does I mean he, he doesn't even do them like he used to you know to be honest yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll see what this new game he's got coming out hope maybe he'll give us some of that Kojima juice back yeah it's it's funny you you mentioned that about the game and kind of when this game came out during my research here and i forgot to bring this in and put it up uh in the notes is that this game was originally intended to be released on the ps3 but they didn't want to the, the wait became too long for them for when the ps3 was coming out they're like let's just put this on the ps2 and when you put that into perspective and you play the game you're like this was on the ps2 like yeah how <laughs> so it's yeah it's crazy, man. It's funny that you mentioned the sorrow boss fight, which is one we totally skip. It's one of my just my favorite scenes of the game because of that thing. If like it, you see the bodies of the, the people you killed in the game, and it's just wild. I found this when I was doing research on the game. This one person says, "Fun fact: um, If you kill a soldier on the mountain, wait for the vulture to come by and eat the dead body. Then kill the vulture and eat the vulture." And he goes, "Don't ask why, just do it." When you get to the Sorrow boss fight, there will be a soldier with a vulture perched on his shoulder screaming at you. I ate or you ate me. You ate me. No, I am not kidding. This is why wow. Kojima is awesome. And I'm like, <laughs> even stuff to that degree has that level of detail, man. It's this. This is really it's like you said, Jonathan, man. If people ask you like about games or something, what should I check out? This is one of the games I would easily recommend so fast because it gives you the story. It gives you the action. It gives you the game. It just gives you everything you want in a game, including some romance stuff, which is a little yeah, Logan, risque at times. I've, I've played but. this game and beaten this game probably like eight, nine, ten times. And that thing you just mentioned about the vulture, I just found out today watching the playthrough. That guy did that. Oh, really? And I, I learned probably like seven, eight, nine things that gameplay things. I'm like, oh, you can you can do that. I, I yeah. genuinely it's 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 mind boggling the degree that Kojima went to to just introduce these completely unnecessary and superfluous kind of quirks to the game. Yeah. Uh, just so cool. Sorry. Well, I'll keep keep I'll, I'll stop, uh, you know, talking about that. We were kind of beating a dead horse, but it's just so cool. The amount of stuff he put into this game. <laughs> Well, no, man, it's all good. I was actually about to ask you all if you have any other closing remarks because we could we could probably spend easily another hour talking about this game and, and maybe we'll do a part two of this episode i i don't know but man this game i i think i've exhausted a lot of what i said there's more i could say but it's all kind of more granular stuff um in comparison but jonathan let's kick it to you man any closing thoughts about metal gear solid 3 um as we've talked about it metal gear solid one is my favorite and i think a lot mm -hmm. of that nostalgia plays a big part in that but <laughs> as we've kind of been sitting yeah. here reminiscing i'm just like man maybe it's metal gear solid 3 um yeah. you know definitely one of my favorite games of all time uh you know to me it definitely solidifies and, and shows why kojima is just such a a wonderful talent in this you know gaming industry i mean i think just media period i'd, I'd love to see him do a movie you know just his, yeah. his directorial skills and things like that but i would uh it's it's like the nucleus of the metal gear series because it's like four it, and i didn't have a ps3 when four came out so i i heard all the learned all the secrets and stuff from like you know threads and you know spoilers but i mean it's mm -hmm. i i dare not spoil it for anybody that hasn't played it but when yeah. you play this and you play four and if you've played the first one and mind blown is is an understatement <laughs> I mean, yeah. the storytelling and the attention to detail to be able to go back you know this is like the phantom menace or the, the anakin darth vader story for a big boss you know you're kind of just seeing you know where he came from and how he ended up where he did but 
he's not really what you thought he was, you know, or how you really, how you yeah. really thought he was, yeah. you know, it's great stuff. No, that's good. Michael, what about you? Um, I, I don't have anything else that's coming to mind that I want to mention. I was sort of just thumbing, thumbing through my notes here, trying to see if there's anything else I wanted to mention. Um, nothing's jumping out. I think it pretty much covered it all. Um, just a, uh, I was surprised at how, how well it holds up still, um, in, yeah. in almost every aspect, um, just a quality game that, um, you know, uh, you know there, there's rumors like I've, I think I've mentioned in the past, there's rumors that this is the game that's going to get a remake from Konami and not the first Metal Gear, which would be interesting. Mm-hmm. So if that happens, yeah. I would be all for it for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I remember when you had mentioned that, I was like, man, I don't know how I feel about that. But after playing this again, I'm like, you know what? I'm totally OK with that. Yeah, because. This is this is a game, you know, sometimes you'll see on like social media people ask, you know, if you could forget one game and play it again for the first time, what would it be? And I'm like, it's it's always this game. I wish I could forget this game so bad so I could play it again for the first time just to experience it all over again. It's ah uh, is Metal Gear Solid 3 better than Persona? You bet your butt it is. That's what I'm going to end Heck yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so good, man. It is so good. But dear listeners, always, if you want to continue the conversation, maybe there's something you remember from the game you want to talk about, hit us up on Discord, Twitter, all those fun places you can uh, let us know. YouTube as well. Leave a comment as well over there. But this is our second episode of the month, which means it's our patron thank you episode. So... As always, over on Patreon.com, you can support us for as low as a dollar a month and get early uncut access to all of our episodes, behind the scenes and more, and allows us to continue doing what we're doing here at the show. Um, Skinner wanted me to thank you all because of your support over on Patreon. He was able to upgrade his computer to get more RAM, which makes uh, editing uh, his uh, the audio stuff and some of the video stuff he does for his church, but also this podcast a lot smoother. It runs better, and so he'll be... Uh, he just wanted me to express that to you also. I wanted to bring that up. Um, but again, those people who support us for the month of October, uh, we'll read through those. And Micah, if you want to read the blue and I'll take the red, we'll go from there. Yeah. Thank you. Patrons, Aaron L. White, Alex Castellanos, Boulder Boulder, Chris Freeman, Christopher Commander, David Henderson, David Matthews, Derek Smith, Jake Walker, Jeff Jackson, Jr., Jimmy Changa, John Hannon, Jonathan Harrison, Josh Broccolo, Joshua, the Super Llama Johnson, Clay Brandon, Kokoradaki, Luke Strain, Matt Edwards, Matthew White Chocolate McDougal, Matthew Millsap, Melvin Benson V, Micah Hendrick, Michael Toller, Mr. Butts, Nate McKeever, Porcho, Richard Marroquin, Ryan 1701E, Sam White, Savone Pena, Sojourner, Third Strongest Mole, Tim Syriac, Travis, Vincent Yu, Wesley Ray, Yuki Ailey, and Zachary Nelson. Y'all, thank you so much for your continued support over on Patreon.com. It allows us to keep the lights on, allows Skinner to uh, upgrade his computer. And uh, it allows us to, yeah, just basically keep what we're doing over here. So we appreciate your support over there as well. We understand that kind of with the times, I'm not, I'm not unaware of this. We are in a recession. I feel it every time I go grocery shopping or go get gas. If you can't support us financially, I totally understand it. Don't feel like you got to do it. Okay, you can support us a variety of ways. Just listening to the show, sharing it. That does a lot. Does more than than you probably think. So, y'all keep doing that. Would appreciate it if you're in the Discord or Facebook group. Love all the interaction going on there. Just remember, if you're in the Discord, don't scroll up. People in the Discord know what that means. I'll leave that there. But this wouldn't be a TRG episode if we just left and didn't give you any recos, any things to check out. Obviously, you should check out Metal Gear Solid 3 if you can. Um, But here's some other recos. Jonathan, man, let's start off with you. What are some things that our dear listeners should check out? The New City Catechism. Uh, I had to Google what a catechism was. It's like a kind of like a... (laughs) uh, kind of like a document or well, in this case, it's an application, mm-hmm. which really teaches you the foundations of your faith as a believer. You know, I think it's really important mm-hmm. to know why you believe what you believe. And so this has really Absolutely. helped me. Uh, it's got like, like the first one is what is our only hope in life and death? And it gives you an answer. Um, it gives you scriptures to, uh, to back that up, it gives you commentary. And then it also has a prayer. And the, so, I mean, it's just, for me, I'm, I'm really at a point of really wanting to, even though I've I've been walking this walk for years, I want to have more of a solid foundation with it, you know, to, to be mm-hmm. able to in, uh, improve my engagement, you know, with non-believers, you know, to know I, I can yeah. I can understand for myself and in my head why I believe what I believe, what I believe. But I want to be able mm-hmm. to uh, to communicate that and express that to others. 
you know, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. And this, this app has been a phenomenal tool for me to kind of just really help with that. Yeah. Right on, man. Very good stuff. Micah. What about you, man? What's one of your recos? Yeah, I just wanted to keep it on theme with Metal Gear Solid 3. So we, I think, Logan, you uh, briefly mentioned it already, but the secret theater that is part of Metal Gear Solid 3, it comes with the subsistence uh, version of the game. Or just go to YouTube and type in MGS3 secret theater and you'll see all like yeah. 40 minutes of it or whatever. It's basically like imagine um, if Metal Gear Solid had a blooper reel. That this is kind of what this is like a Hideo Kojima version of bloopers. It is, it is so funny. Some of the some of the scenarios and these things. I remember watching it for the first time with my buddy Daniel. We were crying on the floor, <laughs> laughing so hard. Just a quick <laughs> example, like the epic scene where Snake is parachuting in at the very beginning of the game and right at the cliff he lets go he like unhooks uh, unhooks himself and he drops and lands really epically right at the edge of the cliff kind of with his hands spread out anyway in this one like blooper version he unclips and just goes flying off the cliff to his death <laughs> and major zero is like snake snake <laughs> and it's like time paradox um, game over <laughs> so, and he's just like that's ah! awesome. so <laughs> A bunch of good little kind of blooper skits, like different takes of a bunch of scenes you know and love. But and these are completely, you know, developed and and cut and edited and everything else by Kojima and 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 company. So they're all with the yeah. game. It's just really funny stuff. All sorts of just goofy scenarios. Really funny stuff. So yeah, MGS three secret theater. Right on, man. That's awesome. That's one of the things I need to check in. You know, when we did Metal Gear Solid 2, I looked at some of the extra stuff. I was like, oh, this is really cool. I didn't do that for this one. And, man, I'm really regretting it because it sounds like there's a lot of stuff yeah. for me to check out. So I think after uh, we finish this recording, that's what, I'll, that's what I'll do is go check out some of that stuff, especially <laughs> Metal Gear 1 and 2. I did. I totally forgot those were even on the disc. It's good YouTube um, content, man. Put some of those clips in there. That's true. <laughs> that's true. First time playing uh, Metal Gear 1. Is it better than Persona? Let's find out. <laughs> My recos uh, for this week is, of course, check out Sound of the Rain's music. He, I told him this at the beginning, like at the pre-show. I listened to this new song he put out called Fall, and y'all, it took me right back to when I was younger, hanging out with my brother, driving in the car, cruising around town, listening to music. I was like, this is this is similar to the stuff that we listen to. Uh, definitely cleaner content-wise, yeah. <laughs> but don't tell my mom or my dad that because they weren't supposed to know what we were listening to. <laughs> anyway, uh, go check that out. Go subscribe to his YouTube channel. It is, it's really, that song is so stupid good oh my gosh I've listened to it several times already so you need to go listen to it uh, dear listeners my other reco is because i just realized i haven't talked about gundam this entire episode <laughs> and skinner i know right now is cringing a little bit because he thought he, we were going to get an episode where i don't bring it up at all i'm just going to say this if you like anime go check out crunchyroll i've been enjoying it just kind of seeing all the different anime that's coming out i guess a chainsaw man got put on there that people are raving about so i'm gonna go check that out but there's there's some wholesome stuff on there too there's some uh, there's some other good stuff on there too that you can go check out so if you like anime or if you've been wanting to get back into it i know they have like seven day free trials you can try it out for yourself subtitled dubbed anime all that stuff on there um i will say this this is specifically for alex casolanos because he was not really chastising me, but definitely doing one of those things where, like, I'm not mad. I'm disappointed a little bit when he learned that I watch anime and dubs. I'm coming around to subtitles a little bit because I'm actually retaining the story more. So I might become a, a subtitle only kind of guy at this point. But we'll see how that goes. So that's for you, Alex. But with that being said, dear listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of The Reform Gamers. If you want to support the show, you already know how to do that. You can do so financially over on Patreon. You can do so just by listening to this episode. Greatly appreciate you taking the time to do that, even if you listen to just a couple different parts uh, that were kind of you were most interested in. Greatly appreciate uh, you just taking the time out of your day to listen to our show. Um, but yeah, just appreciate that. Um, if you want to connect with us, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Discord. Links to all that stuff will be in your show notes. Don't worry, I've got you covered. Uh, and then also, if you want some extra content, maybe some funny shorts from games that we're, that we're playing, uh, go over to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash reform gamers, uh, and just uh, check that stuff out there. we got a lot of extra content going up, and you can enjoy that stuff there. Um, i trying to think if there's anything else I'm missing. I think that's it. If I'm missing anything, there will be links in your show notes, so you can go check that out. But Jonathan, man, dude, it's always a blast having you on. I wish – I was thinking – 
you know, like, crap, we have no real way to play Metal Gear Solid 4, so how are we going to do a Metal Gear Solid 4 episode? Bums me out, man. I don't know. We're going to have to find a way. To watch do. the video on uh, Kef. I think the channel is called Kefka HD, and he's taking, like, okay. all the games and made them put them in, like, some type of movie format. Dude. But uh, I'm down. It's, it's been so long since I've played 4. I've, I've got to get, get hands-on with it again if I want to speak yeah. about it. But, yeah, we I would love to do that again. Yeah. But no, we'll we'll definitely like if we do if we if we manage to get one lined up, man, you're coming back on. I don't oh, care yeah. if you say no. no. I don't care what other prior engagements you got. I would never say I mean, no, I kind of do. I, um, I definitely <laughs> enjoy uh, the dear listeners, man. I, I've had you know some of them interacting with me. It's definitely a great crowd, man. So I, it's yeah, greatly man. appreciated. Well, I appreciate that, man. I'm glad. I'm glad our dear listeners could support you, could love on you, and get connected with you as well. So, man, like I said, you're always welcome here at TRG. Uh, what's that thing that we said with Adam a couple episodes ago? It's like it's always we with TRG. Yeah, That's yeah, it. man. That's how it is with Sound of the Rain, man. It's always we with TRG. Um, but yeah, anyway, dear listeners, again, thank you for listening to this episode. Uh, and as always, be a dear, keep it locked here, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Reformed Gamers, the podcast all about theology and gaming. TRG is edited by Dear Ear Productions, so thank them for the buttery smooth tones in your ear. If you're looking for extra content, head on over to youtube.com slash the reformed gamers. The Reformed Gamers is entirely fan supported over on patreon.com slash the reformed gamers by our dear patrons. The following dear are at the producer level or higher and will forever be thanked at the end of each show. As long as their pledge comes through, or we forget to update the audio. Those people are David Matthews, Mr. Butts, Richard Moroccan, and Wesley Ray. Thank you for your support on Patreon.com, keeping our controllers charged, and supporting Logan in his never-ending quest to collect them all. Platinum trophies, that is. So be a dear, and keep it locked here. Keep listening. We'll catch you later.